everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I will be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about the origins of life. Topic for the day is going to be natural selection. I'm warning you right off the bat, we've got a lot of material to cover. I'm going to try to talk fast, not too fast, but I'm just going to tell you right off the bat that this video might run a little bit longer than the 10 minutes that I usually shoot for, but that kind of seems to be the trend for the series anyway. So by the end of the video, here are the things that I need you to know or to be able to do. First one, describe mechanisms that can alter allele frequencies in a population. Explain how natural selection can lead to adaptive evolution. And finally, compare and contrast different types of natural selection. So that's what we're after. Let's go ahead and get going. First topic for the day is natural selection. Big overview. This is what we're going to be talking about for the rest of this video. A couple of de definitions that you need to know are something that I want to define for you. You see down there at the bottom it says changes in allele frequency lead to adaptive evolution. If we are going to define the term evolution, I want you to recognize that as a change in allele frequency. If you remember, an allele is one form of a gene. So if you got a gene for eye color, you could have the dominant form could have the recessive form. If the dominant form or the recessive form becomes more prevalent in a population over time, that population is said to have evolved. Now we've seen natural selection there. If we work off of Darwin's theory, natural selection is going to be the mechanism that causes organisms to have those alleles become more or less um, prevalent in a population. That is adaptive evolution. Adaptive evolution is the environment working on the population through natural selection, the alleles that will become more prevalent as that uh, species evolves will be the alleles that best adapt them to their specific environment. Now as we talk about natural selection, there are a couple different things that we want to talk about within this idea of natural selection. We want to talk about how populations can change over time. First thing I want to mention is genetic drift, and this is a change in allele frequency. All this is about allele frequency. Um, change, and re change related to chance, and this deals with small populations. So if you've got a small population, your gene pool is very small, you don't have so many alleles in there, if you lose part of your population, you have lost a disproportionately large amount of your gene pool. Like right there, you see the really kind of janky, pixely picture of a foot stepping on a population of beetles. If that population had like six brown beetles and then three green beetles, and a foot stepped on that population and crushed the three green be green beetles, that foot has had a disproportionate effect on your population. So recognize that small populations are most susceptible to genetic drift, which is just random chance having a big effect on the allele frequencies in that population. Now a couple other effects we want to talk about when within this idea of small populations. There is the founder effect. Founder effect is the idea that if you have individuals that move to an area, whatever traits they take with them may become more common in that population than they would be in the world as a whole. So an example of this, there are some communities up in northeast part of America where polydactyly, having an extra thumb like you see there on the right, is actually a relatively common trait, obviously in the population at large. It's not common at all, but within this population, it's fairly common. The reason for that would be that the individuals that moved there, a couple of them had the, ele the recessive allele for that trait, and then as they all had children with each other, kind of staying within their small community, that recessive allele became more common in the population because you would have carriers mating with each other, producing kids that had this allele. So where you would see like in a normal situation, that allele would mix throughout the population. People would be contributing dominant um, alleles to cover over the recessive allele. Within this community, there are not very many dominant alleles, so that recessive allele has become more common, and that would be an example of the founder effect. Next one we want to talk about with regard to small populations is the bottleneck effect. And the example you see there on the right, cheetahs are a perfect example of this. A bottleneck occurs when you have a sudden reduction in the gene pool. Gene pool, remember we talked about, is all of the genes that are in a population. And right there on the right, you'll see up at the top, you've got like an hourglass-shaped setup on the top. All the colors represent all of the genes and variations on genes in that population. Put a bottleneck on that, squeeze down the top, and as those genes kind of pour down to the next generation, only some get through. So you see the next generation isn't multicolored. It's got like purple and blue and green in it, and that's all. 
So whatever event causes a large proportion of the gene pool to die off will be seen in that population for the rest of its existence because now rather than having all of those colors to draw from, the species going forward will only have that gene pool that's got three colors to draw from. Um, there's a lot of problems with cheetahs and health out in the wild because something somewhere along the way severely bottlenecked their gene pool and so cheetahs have got a very shallow gene pool that they are currently working with which makes them uh, susceptible to sickness and disease and things like that. Next up on the parade is I want to talk really quickly about the effects of genetic drift and these are some of the things that you see within small populations. First of all I mentioned this already it has a disproportionate effect on a small population so that would be like boom foot steps on the beetles takes out all the green ones that's a disproportionate effect. Um, there can be random frequency changes. So if you've got a really big population, random mutations or things like that aren't going to have a big effect on the population as a whole if we were thinking about evolution because those mutations will be covered up by all the other genes in the pool. <clears throat> but if you've got a really small population, a random mutation could have a big effect on the allele frequencies within that population. Also, you can have a loss of variation. That would be an example of the founder effect where if you've got a bunch of heterozygous individuals mating within a small population, eventually you're going to get a situation where you've got a lot of homozygous on either side and you lose some of that variation if you're not having new genes come in and stir in the pot a little bit. And finally, harmful alleles can become fixed. Fixed just means that they are stuck within that population. So whereas in a big population they might keep getting circulated out to where they remain in a heterozygous condition or disappear altogether, if they're within a small population, they could become fixed, which means that they become very common and they're just kind of stuck in the genome of that population. Now, <clears throat> kind of shifting away from genetic uh, drift, we're going to talk about gene flow. Gene flow is just the idea of genetics or genetic material moving from one place to another. So let's say you have got two populations of organisms, and I honestly I have no idea what this map represents, but I'm going to make it represent what I want. Let's say you have got a population of birds, and birds are a bad example, let's go a population of deer over here. You have a second population of deer over here. Left to their own devices, these two populations, obviously they are separated by rivers and things like that, they would become their own populations with traits unique to that population. They would kind of evolve to match each of these areas. But gene flow flowing between these two populations, if individuals leave one, they take genes, let's say an individual leaves this pool, he takes genes out of this gene pool and takes them over to this one. So he has now altered both pools in that this one has become larger with more variation and this one has lost some of its variation. So just recognize gene flow is the movement of organisms between populations. All right, selection and fitness. This is kind of like the next topic in our talk today. Selection is natural selection. When I talk about selection, I'm talking about natural selection, which obviously is the environment acting on a trait or set of traits in a population. I got fitness up there because I want to make a distinction. When we're talking about evolution, fitness does not talk about your ability to run or whatever. It is your ability to reproduce. Okay, The organism that can make the most babies is the fittest organism as far as evolution is concerned. So stick that in your head right now. <clears throat> but selection and fitness leads to adaptive evolution. That's how we actually get populations evolving into new species that are better adapted to their environment than their ancestors were. There are three major types of selection that I'm going to talk about and we'll just kind of go through it. So the curves on the right um, essentially show numbers of pop numbers in a population that have got a certain trait. So the graph on the right you can't really see it all that well but up this axis right here sorry is individuals and we're talking about cacti, so we've got a number of spines right here. Normally this population sits right here. That is the normal distribution of this population. You can see most of the individuals in the population have got 90-ish spines, and then you've got a bell curve that goes along with that. In directional selection, there is some force that causes the population to move in one direction towards one extreme. So the example here, you have a peccary, peccaries eat cactus. So it is advantageous for the cactus to have their population move in the direction of having more spines so that the peccary will not be as likely to eat them. Now note that these are not the cactus thinking, oh I'm suddenly going to pop out more spines. No. 
This is the peccary eating the individuals that have fewer spines, leaving the ones that have the most spines to reproduce, passing that trait along to their kids. So over time, that whole population shifts towards having more spines. Next up on the hit parade is disruptive selection. Now I'm going to tell you right now, I have no idea what the pictures on the top are talking about, but we are dealing with cacti, cacti still. And you can see, <clears throat> here is our normal distribution right here. In disruptive selection, it is advantageous for the organism to be on one side or the other. So this one species of cacti may diverge into two versions, where one version, it is really advantageous to have fewer spines. The other version, it's more advantageous to have lots of spines. So in disruptive selection, the population essentially splits in two. You have half the population moving towards one extreme, while the other half of the population moves towards the second extreme. And finally, we have got stabilizing selection. In stabilizing selection, the mean becomes the best place to be. So you can see there the small faint green graph on the bottom. Over time, you've got select selection from peccaries eating them, so those plants want to have more spines, but the ones that have got too many spines are subject to parasitism. So most of the population is going to become squeezed such that they sit in that middle range. All right, So be able to talk about those three and recognize situations where a population might move in a directional, disruptive, or stabilizing direction. I think this is the last one, though I'm not sure. Um, last type of selection I want to talk about is sexual selection. And we see this all the time in the living world. A couple terms that I want to note here. First one is dimorphism. Sexual dimorphism is something you will hear about a lot. That is just the situation where one sex of a species looks very different from another sex. This is seen all the time in birds. Right here, we've got a male bird of paradise. The males look all crazy like this with blue and yellow and black and blue feet. The females, they're just pretty drab brown. Okay, so that would be an example of sexual um, dimorphism. Now, over time, there are two types of sexual selection. First one is intrasexual. In intrasexual selection, you have got the same sex competing for the right to mate. So if you have ever watched, I don't know, Discovery Channel, you will see those pictures of two mountain goats or two rams or whatever button heads for the right to mate with the females. That would be intra. Intra is in, like I-N-T-R-A is talking about within something. So this is sexual selection within the same sex. They are fighting for that right to mate. So over time, what you're going to see is the male population would shift towards whatever traits make those animals most successful in a fighting situation or a competition situation. So in this case, it would be a male or female population shifting in the direction for whatever you know makes them best able to com compete. Sorry about that. Had all kinds of glitches with my computer lately and my fingers and whatever. It's almost Thanksgiving break. But I just got done talking about intrasexual selection. The last one I'm going to talk about is intersexual selection. In intersexual selection, you have got one sex selecting the other sex. And this is what leads to sexual dimorphism. So, for example, with the birds of paradise, the females, which are very drab brown, have consistently selected males that have whatever trait. It might be the curliest tail feathers, it might be the bluest feet, it might be the bluest head, whatever. Over time, the females consistently select whatever trait is appealing to them, which means that when those males have the chance to mate, they pass those traits along to the next generation. So over time, you will see a broad gap start to form in the appearance between the males and the females because the males are passing on whatever trait the females have selected for. So that trait is going to become more common in the population over time. All right, last slide for the day. Here's where we finish up. Um, so we got all this selection going on, and yet variety remains. There are a lot of mechanisms for this, but there's one I want to make you aware of because you hear about it all the time. This is the idea of heterozygote advantage. And this is the idea that sometimes even when you have a damaging or a detrimental allele, it might be helpful to be heterozygous. So the very most common example of this is sickle cell anemia. If you have got homozygous dominant traits, you are completely fine. Every blood cell in your body is normal and functioning. If you are homozygous recessive, 
all of your blood cells have the sickle trait and could sickle at any time. If you are heterozygous, you have got a mix between the two. Now, normally, in a typical situation, not so good to be heterozygous because you still got some uh, blood cells that are going to sickle on you and cause problems occasionally. But there are parts of the world, hint, 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 I got Africa right here, where it is actually advantageous to be heterozygous. This map right here is showing you the distribution of malaria throughout Africa. And obviously, in darker places, malaria is most common. You can lay a map over the top of this with distribution of sickle cell anemia, and they look almost identical because malaria is a parasite that lives within the red blood cells. If blood cells are sickled, then the parasite cannot live in there. So being heterozygous gives you a resistance to malaria, but you also still have got enough healthy blood cells to function. If you are this homozygous condition and you have got sickle cell anemia full on, that's not advantageous because you're sick. Like sickle cell anemia is a really rough disease, so that's not good. And if you are homozygous dominant, you are very susceptible to malaria. So in some cases, it is actually beneficial to be a heterozygote, even if being heterozygote means having the damaged allele or the allele that is normally undesirable. So I know that was a lot of information. I know I talked a lot. Hopefully you got all that down. If not, we'll talk about it in class. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and hopefully we'll see you again.